Hi, everyone. Hold on to your hats and get yourself cozy because today's episode is shocking. I have three stories that are sure to remind you to keep your eyes and ears open and looking over your shoulder. Not paying attention is not an option. So get ready to batten down the hatches, but first, please capture that subscribe button. Great. Now let's get into the stories. I had planned to spend a week camping and exploring Voyagers National Park in northern Minnesota in the summer of 2015. Voyagers is pretty remote, and to be honest, I was a little nervous traveling solo up there. There are only two campsites in the entire park that don't require a boat to access. I had done quite a bit of solo travel in the past, and I told myself that everything would be fine. I had just seen the movie Backcountry which is a gruesome film about a predatory black bear that attacked two campers in Canada. I blamed that for my uneasiness, and I brought two extra cans of bear spray. It was a five-hour drive to the park, and my fears seemed to settle by the time I reached the park in the early afternoon. I had reservations for two campsites during my trip. The first was only a 20-minute paddle from the lot where I parked my truck. The second campsite which I had planned to reach on Thursday, was a great deal more remote. As soon as I reached the forest on the other side of the river, my fears returned. Looking back, I now know it was the silence. I didn't realize it at the time, but that's what it was. And it wasn't just the kind of silence you get when the animals see a human in the forest. It was like the whole landscape was frozen. Nothing moved at all. Not the wind, not the leaves on the trees, or the clouds in the sky. There were no birds, no squirrels, no bugs, nothing. Like I said, I didn't realize what it was at the time, I just knew something was very wrong. I kept my bear spray close as I set up camp. The strange silence would come and go throughout the evening, and I did my best to ignore it. But what came later, I could not ignore. It was a stench, an ungodly, rotten stench. I was putting out my fire for the night, and suddenly it smelled like the whole forest had died. The smell was everywhere. I looked around for the source, but I couldn't pinpoint it. I circled around the campsite, and the smell was just as strong on one side as it was on the other. I didn't know what it was. The only thing I knew is that I did not want to be in the woods that night but then the smell disappeared after maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And I mean, completely disappeared, as if nothing had happened at all. I went to bed about an hour later, and I didn't think about the strange smell anymore that night. Over the next few days, I would encounter that smell on and off. It wouldn't last longer than 30 minutes, but it was an all-encompassing event when it happened. It was so bad, I could barely breathe without gagging. After the third time it happened, I realized that it was preceded by that strange, unnatural silence. The forest would get quiet, like it was frozen, and then the smell would arrive. And when the smell disappeared, the forest would become alive again. I was averaging about 15 miles a day on foot, and more than that if I traveled the waterways in the pack raft. And somehow, the smell would follow me, wherever I went. I thought there must be something medically wrong with me, literally. The forest would go silent and then it felt like I had lost my hearing and then this stench would fill the air with no source. It had to be me. I must be having some sort of hallucination, medical emergency. At least that's what I thought at the time. I realized later I was being followed. I stuck with my plan of reaching the remote backcountry campsite by Thursday afternoon. The trek to get there was mostly by water, and it was in the water when I finally saw what had been following me and causing the horrible smell. I was in my pack raft when I saw a pack of wolves swimming across the river. It was a rare sight, even in northern Minnesota. There are definitely wolves in the backcountry, but they're rarely seen. There were four wolves, and they were swimming with determination. What I didn't notice at first was the elk swimming behind them. I couldn't see its face while it was in the water, just the antlers. 
and at first glance I thought it was just a pair of antlers or a skull floating in the water since elk shouldn't even have a full set of antlers this time of year. But as I watched closer, it was definitely swimming and it looked like it was chasing the wolf pack. The elk's whole head was submerged under the water. I had no idea how it could hold its breath that long. As I continued to watch the scene unfold, that strange silence fell upon the water. I didn't need to wait for the stench to arrive before I knew that whatever was below those antlers was the thing that was following me in the forest. The wolves reached the shore and bolted into the woods. The creature was still swimming. I started paddling upriver from the direction I came. I knew what was going to come out of that water was some sort of monster, and I wasn't about to spend another night out there with it. I had created some distance between myself and the creature, but not enough to feel remotely safe. The creature then emerged from the water, and the stench hit me despite being at least 50 yards away. It was a revolting sight. It had the body of an elk, but it was basically a walking skeleton. Its fur was white and nearly transparent, as was its skin. In some places, I could see the pink of its organs through the skin, but that wasn't even the worst part. It had no hair on its face. I don't even think it had skin. It looked like just a skull with two dark sockets where its eyes should have been, and a gaping hole for the nose. It turned, and it looked at me. It looked as if it was deciding if it should pursue me or the wolves. I had my bear spray, but I also had doubts that it would work on this thing. It watched me for a moment as I very slowly paddled backwards before taking off down the path behind the wolves. I can't tell you how fast I paddled out of there. I haven't been camping alone since, nor have I ever smelled anything like that ever again. But I know that if I do, I'm getting the hell out of the woods before I meet that thing again. Seeing it once was more than enough for me. I can't say I'm happy to be writing to you, but I sure do have a story to tell. I want to be clear and let you know that I know it sounds wild, but it's the truth. And if you don't want to believe it, it's fine, but I have the scars to prove it. I'm a lobster fisherman by trade. I work on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and I earn a pretty decent wage. If you don't mind smelling like the sea, it's not so bad. Last year, my friend and I went in on a new boat together. We were running along as freelancers for a while, but we decided it was about time we become our own bosses and set sail under our own conditions. The first issue with being a captain is finding a crew. Although we have tons of friends in the industry, it's risky to join with a new captain, and there are union benefits in place to prevent movement to a new boat. A few decided to jump ship and come with me, but not enough to run smoothly. So I was a captain without a full crew. For the most part, boats these days can steer themselves, but the boys are needed for maintenance and upkeep on board, and for safety. I don't know what compelled me that day to do it, but I went out alone. It was clear skies and smooth sails, so I never thought that I would have a problem. I was about a mile out to sea when I saw the first clouds roll in. They were thick and heavy, and right away I knew I was done for. The rain and the wind came on fast, and before I knew it, I was fighting against the elements. It was rough and I was scared half to death. My sonar system started to malfunction, and I couldn't get a good read on the map. Little did I know, this wouldn't be the worst thing to happen to me that day. I was pushed to an inlet, the waves were huge and spilling up on my deck. I spotted an old harbor, one that had been abandoned some time ago for a newer set of docks about a half mile north. In my mind, an abandoned harbor means empty docks and a clear spot for landing to sit out the storm. I fought against the waves and wind and I steered over and I did my best to drop anchor. I figured if I could just wait out the storm, I'd be okay. Through the rain and the fog, though, I saw a beast approaching. It was walking up the dock on all fours. 
At first I thought it was a wolf or a coyote or something, but those things aren't really spotted out on the Cape. And then I think to myself, maybe it's just a big dog, like a pit bull or something. And man, those guys can be mean, but at least you know what you're dealing with. But then it stood up, like on its two feet, up in the air. And it was so tall, really tall. And it was mean looking. Its face just looked like a hound, like a German shepherd or something, with fat globs of drool dripping down its chin. It looked me right in the eyes and snarled at me with these sharp yellow teeth. I saw its ears twitch as it pushed through the rain. Well, all this time that it's walking up the dock, I'm just staring over at it and I can't move. It's like I'm paralyzed or something. And it's only when it's like 10 feet away that I realize it's coming right for me now. It was walking slowly, like pacing up a predator. And I didn't know if I should stay in place or freeze, or if I should try to get the boat out on the water. It was still pouring and foggy and wavy and windy, but I decided that I would rather face the elements out there than face this creature. So I started to untie the knots and roll up the anchor. The waves had been pushing me so close to the dock that I actually had fastened myself right on to keep from hitting it. I needed to lean over the edge to get the boat untied. I tried to do it as quickly as possible, but the rain made the knot slip and tighten, and being near that thing was making my hands shake. I just about had the knot loose when I felt this sharp pain in my arm. The dog thing had taken a whole chomp out of my arm, and it wasn't letting me go. I screamed in pain, but I knew nobody would hear me. I pulled my arm away from the beast and I jumped back. Amazingly, it let me go. I fell onto the boat right on my butt and I had the rope in my hand. The knot had come undone. The beast was perched on the edge of the boat as it started to be set free from the dock. A huge wave splashed over the deck and the entire ship rocked back and forth. The creature looked around at the waves, then it looked at me, and then jumped off the boat and back onto the dock. I don't want to say I'm lucky because I sailed back to shore to the emergency room and I had to get nine staples in my arm. But I'm lucky that I'm alive. The size of the bite meant that the thing was way too large to be a pit bull, or a bobcat, or a wolf. The scar takes up half of my forearm. This had to have been a dog man. It looked just like the descriptions other people have had, and I just can't shake that image of it snarling at me. I hope no one else out on the Cape has to deal with that thing. I know your inbox must be flooded with stories, but this one just might be a bit different than the rest. That's because I've been tracking these ships for some time now, and I'm positive that I've been studying an alien species. This may sound insane, and my family definitely thinks so, but I have a great deal of evidence compiled that could sway even the most ardent non-believer. I'm based in New Mexico, near the border to Mexico. I won't share exact details, but I can describe the general location. It's not a highly populated area, and there's not much out here except the highway and a few rest stops. I have a day job, which I will not reveal, but I do my main investigations at night. You see, the weather here is hot and dry, so it's a lot easier to canvas the area when the sun's not out. Otherwise, you end up with a mean sunburn and possible dehydration. I've been plotting the flight patterns of two spacecrafts. The first is a square-shaped hovercraft that flies pretty close to the ground. It ducks in and out and can do flips and turns. You may have thought at first that it was a drone, but there are no government or recreational drones that have the capability to vanish into thin air. And that's just what it does. It will fly around the desert and near my home base and eventually pick up speed. It'll flash a bright neon blue light and then disappears. It always starts off in the same area at about 9 p.m. and I have followed it for up to a mile. At 3 a.m. it always vanishes, although sometimes it will blink away earlier than that. If I'm not able to keep up with it in my car or on foot, I can sometimes lose it but usually it moves at quite a slow pace. 
the second spacecraft is much larger and much more difficult to consistently track. It's more of a traditional UFO. I try not to use that phrase though, as it has been so misconstrued by the media and the government, but it looks more like the general public's idea of an alien ship. And you know what? There is clearly a reason that so many people have seen these ships out here in New Mexico and Texas and Nevada. It's because this flight path is strategically placed to connect with the gravitational pull at the equator. I can get into this theory more so in private. The ship travels from the east to the west, and I've calculated it to be moving at about 15 miles an hour. Sometimes it'll pause and stop for a moment as a car passes by or an animal walks through the area, but it typically continues at a steady pace. The ship flies at an altitude far lower than a plane, and it creates a ripple effect behind it. There's no chemtrail or anything like that. There's only a ripple of heat or gravitational disturbance that follows in its wake. The first time I spotted it, I happened to be outside letting my dog use the facilities at about 2 a.m. I looked overhead, and I saw it. There's a ring of LED light illuminating the edges of the circular craft, but it's otherwise invisible. For the next few weeks, I would set my alarm to go off at 1.50 a.m. and then head outside. I can only speculate on whether these ships are friend or foe, but they're certainly interesting to study. The government bases that are nearby would surely be able to notice these ships on their radar. So I'm unsure why there have been no stories yet released about their presence. The first time I spotted the ship, I created a post on Twitter and on Reddit. And in less than a minute, however, my accounts were banned. I tried to make a new one, but I think they must have been tracking my IP address because I received a pop-up stating that I can no longer access these social media sites. I don't want to attract any more negative attention from these platforms or from the government, so I'm pretty much going to stop talking about this, and I will not be sharing any photos publicly. <laughs> 